Sveicināti godātie viesi, godājumie dalībnieki, dalībnieki. Good morning, honorable guests. Those participants who are in person and those who are watching us uh, remotely. Before we start the content of the conference, I would like to draw your attention to technical things. So I believe and I hope that those of you who need interpretation, you have downloaded the uh, Linearis Interactive app because we will ensure the interpretation and you can get it through this uh, interactive app and the code of this event the, the title is new fuel for business and bhr 2024 is the code thank you very much to our cooperation partners um, um, also the uh, interpreters um, and uh, C, uh, and uh, that uh, pseudo translation is also ensured because it is very important when we speak about business and human rights it's very important that those events are accessible to everyone and with our example we wanted to prove that all the events are accessible to everyone both in terms of language and also uh, in terms of uh, um, being able to come here with a wheelchair and also also to ensure and uh, all the types of translation and also thank you to our wonderful colleagues uh, from uh, the Tiesheide the team. They will help us uh, online here and also remotely. Just a short time ago, when we think about the topic business and human rights, and uh, when we some years ago talked with an ombudsman whether this topic is uh, topical for us, uh, and we thought, no, not in Latvia, everything is good. Maybe we are talking about some remote countries we were thinking when we, for example, when we are purchasing coffee or chocolate, then um, this is binding for other countries far, far away. And then now we see that this idea was actually faulty. And what is the best is uh, that you are able to recognize your mistakes. And so we are happy that we have grown in our understanding that also in Latvia, uh, the topic about uh, human rights and business is very topical. And also in the Ombudsman's office, uh, this is like a new era and we see a lot of potential in it. And thank you to those of you who have devoted your time and you're interested in this topic. And this uh, event wouldn't be possible without our cooperation partners. First of all, the hosts, uh, the, our partners, um, the Riga Graduate School of Law. Uh, thank you very much. Also, thank you to the Nordic Council of Ministers in Latvia and also uh, the partners, uh, the Human Rights, Danish Human Rights Institute, without whom this event wouldn't be possible. So that's all. Thank you very much. And now I will give floor to to the rector of the Riga Graduate Ad uh, School of Law to uh, the rector Adam Chernot for the welcoming speech. Uh, as was mentioned before, my name is Adam Chernot. I am rector of RGSL. So on behalf of RGSL, welcome to this conference. The topic of this conference, for me at least, is extremely intriguing, right? It means relation between human rights and business is always complicated. And... Uh, <clears throat> That's, it seems to me, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion. It means that human rights as fuel for business is something which it seems to me should be really deeply explored here. And I welcome especially representative of the organizer, co-organizers of this conference, namely the <clears throat> people from the office of the Ombudsman of the uh, Republic of Latvia, and also representative of the, another co-organizer, the <clears throat> Uh, Nordic Council of Ministers office in Latvia. I won't speak, speak long, but I am not a human rights lawyer. I am not a business-oriented person. But I am a social-legal scholar. And one of the biggest social theorists, Jürgen Habermas, reminds us that law possesses Janus double face. It could be used as a sword and as a shield. I understand that the role of the institution of ombudsman is to work as a shield, actually, to defend people. Human rights also play the same role. It means the role of the defending the rights of, of citizens, of individual, individuals. 
Business, on the other hand, you know, as you know, is a, quite often, according at least to the, to the <coughs> social theorists, is uh, involved to a high degree in the colonization of something which they called life world. So it means to me, combination of both is it could be an extremely important uh, research area and uh, topic for the discussion. I wish you a fruitful discussion, and uh, I'm looking forward for the exchange of ideas. Welcome. Paldies, rektoram. Es, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. I forgot uh, to mention uh, one very important aspect. Thanks uh, to Tilda, they also have transcripts. So for those people who, for whom it's easier to read the text, also this opportunity and this possibility is provided. Thank you for the opening and keynote speech uh, of the Rector. And, and now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Martin Virgis, my colleague. He is one of the wisest people in Latvia. So Martin, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, all who are present here and also all of those who are watching us online. My name is Martin Birdjevs and I am really honored and happy to be here today in this conference and uh, this conference is about my uh, very beloved topic, uh, human rights and uh, business. I would like to draw your attention to two principal things right now. So how companies impact human rights and uh, what is this uh, field? So human rights and also business. So how we started discussion. So I would like to start that human rights are rights and that uh, each of us possess just because we are humans. And those rights ensure and a human life for us and human dignity. Uh, business, on the other hand, is wonderful tool that allows us to implement those rights. So, um, entrepreneurship, business, ensure workplaces, ensure rights to work, also provide uh, goods and services that are needed for us on a daily basis to ensure our health and other basic needs. And also, it uh, increases the welfare of the state. So, it means that it ensures also primarily the social, economic and cultural rights. And of course, we also have to notice that that uh, getting profit is the basis for entrepreneurship. And that has uh, led us to the situation where international uh, society was shaken because uh, it ended up with tragedies where companies were involved about, for example, uh, gas tragedy in India and also Zovitu, the tragedy, tragedy in Latvia. But on a daily basis, there are also more direct ways how companies and uh, businesses impact human rights, and it's at several levels. First of all, uh, businesses um, have um, power over their employees and how they uh, use and employ and uh, um, use their rights, and also um, over customers. Second is that companies control access to certain resources, whether this is to finances, land, or environment. And third, considering the political influence of businesses. Large businesses can impact the decision makers uh, in their favorable way, uh, promoting the favorable policies for them that are not always in line with uh, human rights interests. And finally, uh, businesses also have um, a possibility directly, directly influence uh, the opinion of society and direct it towards the benefit of the companies instead of benefit for humans and, and individuals uh, in general. So we can see that uh, there are a negative impact of uh, uh, one human rights and uh, with other. For example, one example from Latvia in February, uh, investigative journalists published uh, uh, the story about uh, one very popular company in Latvia that manufactures uh, milk products, uh, dairy products. And this story, which was really uh, very, very um, 
shaking for, for, for us. Um, we heard that, for example, people are employed 300 hours a month, and so the most uh, vulnerable employees, uh, refugees from Ukraine and young people, very often they, they find themselves in situation that they, uh, in some way, um, they get some accidents, lose uh, some part of their body, finger or something, and uh, um, they don't receive any support because those employees are instructed to act in a certain way, not in line with their interests. And so all this introduction was uh, in order to say that um, this um, sector, this um, sphere, business and human rights was created for the reason to understand uh, how companies, how businesses impact human rights and how to reduce this negative impact. And even though there is a kind of um, hard to understand when we started to discuss uh, this topic, but uh, I think we are quite uh, uh, clear that in 2011, when the UN uh, basic principles of human rights were approved, this was like a cornerstone, and it provides for us um, a very strong framework how to look at those uh, issues and problems. And if we look at the further development uh, and how it uh, developed later, you will hear from the experts later. Uh, but I would like to note that John Raggi, when he presented those principles, he acknowledged that this is not uh, the beginning of the end. He, more precisely, he said uh, this is the end of the beginning. Uh, he said this is uh, the beginning for you, how to understand, how to start acting, but now it's uh, your job to implement those principles. And here I would like to use the opportunity and also to say thank you to the Ombudsman's office that those principles are also available in Latvia, in Latvian language. Uh, today it might seem uh, like normal, but it wasn't like that for a long time. And so thanks to the Ombudsman's office, and we can talk about those terms in uh, our united language, in uh, our state language, and we can create a dialogue with um, the decision makers, businesses, and also representatives of the community. I also would like to highlight my own opinion that I have gotten because of my research. So it is clear that only business that is in line with human rights, this is a sustainable and long-term uh, business. So really uh, human rights is the new fuel and companies have to take care so they don't lack it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to Martin. So Martin uh, is a scholar at the University of Latvia, but he is also legal advisor of uh, our parliament, so I didn't exaggerate. You are very, very smart. But now I also would like to ask our cooperation partner, Gabriel Holly, who is uh, the chief advisor for Danish Institute for Human Rights. So Danish uh, people are one of great examples we could follow. So, Gabriel, please, the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you very much. And thank you so much, Martins, for your introduction. I think it's um, I think that the discipline of business and human rights and, and human rights in general can often be quite abstract and hard for people to understand. So the examples you give, I think, help make it much more concrete for everyone in the room to really understand how businesses can impact on human rights. So thank you for that. Um, so, with Martin's good scene setting, um, I'll speak a little bit about uh, this trend toward regulation in the area of business and human rights. And here we see some quite uh, clear trends, particularly at the EU level, where quite a lot is going on uh, at the moment. So, I'll give you a quick introduction of, of how do we get here, how do we have come from the UNGPs being adopted a little over a decade ago to now um, being in a time where there is uh, an increasingly complex regulatory environment for businesses to navigate. And then I'll give you a quick overview of that regulatory environment. So, um, this uh, slide just gives you a little bit of an indication of the evolution um, in this area. 
uh, from the adoption of the UNGPs and OECD guidelines, which are the two kind of main authoritative standards that we use in this area, each of which um, set out this process of human rights due diligence. Um, and we see sort of uh, that kind of, they were adopted a, a decade or so ago. Um, but from there, we see this sort of evolution toward this um, development of policy commitments. Um, we see uh, the commitments toward um, business respect for human rights and the process of human rights due diligence finding its way into EU uh, CSR communication. Uh, we see a number of states developing their own national action plans on business and human rights, so how to implement the UNGPs in the national context. And we also see um, a number of uh, kind of early adopter companies starting to develop policy commitments uh, to respect human rights and, and commit to a process of due diligence. Um, from there, we see this sort of development of disclosure obligations, and they were the kind of like the proto-regulation in this area. Uh, we see obligations to disclose on non-financial matters in the EU through the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which require companies to disclose on, on matters um, including uh, how the company impacted on human rights. And that we've, that's now been evolved into uh, a new regulation, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which has quite granular uh, sustainability reporting standards associated with it, which really require companies to engage with, um, with due diligence, think about um, uh, what impacts they have on people, um, and report on that. So from the reporting obligations, we then started to see the development of national mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence laws. Uh, the first of these came in France in 2017, which required companies to develop uh, what were called vigilance plans, uh, which um, uh, set out how a company was going to kind of um, essentially do due diligence. Uh, recently, we've seen um, laws in, Fr in Germany and Norway. Um, and so, again, you have these legal requirements to undertake um, a, a form of due diligence um, in line with these legal standards very much informed by the process of due diligence outlined in the UNGPs, which you'll hear about a lot today. Um, and I've got here a little box saying, and the EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive is coming. Um, that now is a little bit more uncertain. I don't know how many of you in the room have been following uh, the developments in the last few weeks around the directive, um, but there was an intention to create an EU-level directive requiring companies to undertake um, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence. That uh, agreement now hangs in the balance, and we might see um, an agreement coming in the, this week, um, or it might not materialize at all. But um, again, it's a little bit uncertain, but uh, we'll nonetheless um, cover its main elements in the presentation today. So I won't dwell on this because you'll hear about the UNGPs um, at length today, but just as a kind of reminder that they contain three pillars. Um, pillar two contains this uh, responsibility on business to respect human rights, and uh, which is largely discharged by undertaking human rights due diligence. But what we'll focus on a little bit more in this presentation today is pillar one, the state duty to, um, to protect human rights, which is um, essentially done through enacting and enforcing laws. Again, this is the responsibility of business to essentially conduct human rights due diligence. I won't dwell on this slide because other speakers will speak to it in detail, but there is this kind of ongoing continuous process of due diligence, which has, in this slide, um, four stages. You'll see it sometimes depicted in six stages, eight stages. Wh whichever way it is depicted, as long as it contains the main elements, um, we're good. So under Pillar 1, states um, are, are required to protect human rights, and this is pr primarily done through enacting and enforcing laws. And laws regulating business impacts on human rights can take a, a huge range of forms. Indeed, there are already a range of laws that will be enforced in your jurisdiction, which will, in some ways will regulate how businesses impact on rights, whether that be labour laws, um, whether that be environmental protection laws, uh, consumer laws, um, prohibitions on certain conduct that causes harm, that sort of thing. So there'll already be a legal framework which um, certainly impacts on how businesses uh, can impact on human rights. But nonetheless, we are seeing this trend toward the introduction of these mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence laws, which essentially take this process of due diligence um, outlined in the UNGPs and create a legal obligation, what we often term the hardening of soft law. So um, I put this slide up here not to talk you through it in any detail, and I think it will be too small to really see in any detail, um, but this is a quite a useful graphic, and I'll, I'll make sure that the slides are shared with participants afterwards. Um, it's a graphic created by the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, and it's these concentric circles, which um, start at the beginning with that green dot, uh, which has the adoption of the UNGPs. 
Um, and I put it here uh, not to kind of talk to the content so much, but to just graphically show uh, this explosion of different kinds of standards, national action plans, laws, regulations, guidance documents in this area that have happened since the adoption of the UNGPs at the centre here. Now, this graphic only goes up to 2020. Um, and I think, honestly, if they were to maintain this graphic, um, they would really struggle because in the last few years, there's been, I think, an even greater proliferation of different kinds of standards, laws, national action plans. And I pulled out a couple of the, the sort of the main um, uh, legal developments here. Again, I won't discuss this in kind of in too much detail, but really just to use this slide to show that there has been this kind of extraordinary trend in the development of regulation in this area. And you see the sort of the number of dots starting to um, increase over time. <laughs> um, so we, what we have in here is sort of laws um, that relate to sector or commodity specific initiatives. So we see um, laws regulating um, conf uh, 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 mineral supply chains to address human rights abuses associated with conflict minerals. Uh, we see issue specific initiatives. So those focused on, for example, issues of modern slavery. Um, there have been sort of uh, modern slavery specific laws um, in, the, in the UK, um, in Australia. Um, there's been a, a child labor law um, in the Netherlands that hasn't come into to force yet. And, um, so there's been a kind of uh, a number of uh, regulations which focus on a specific issue. Uh, there's also been um, laws around non-financial reporting, which I touched on earlier. So we had in 2014 at the EU level the non-financial reporting directive, which has been kind of revised and revamped at this, as a corporate sustainability reporting directive now, uh, which is just being transposed um, and requires a much more kind of granular level of engagement of businesses um, with their human rights impacts. We see initiatives on sustainable finance as well, um, so how financial institutions should be um, identifying and assessing um, how they impact on human rights. Um, we also see a development um, at the international level uh, and efforts to create an international treaty on business and human rights. It's happening in parallel with all these national and regional level uh, legal developments. And then, of course, we have mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence laws, which I will speak to. Now, so this um, is a slightly uh, uh, challenging um, initiative to talk about at the moment because it is a little bit uncertain. We don't yet know if this law is, is, is ultimately going to come into force, but it has been under development for the last four years. And it looks as though there is a last chance to create uh, some kind of agreement on this um, this week, um, so we're hopeful that this will find its way into law. Um, but essentially what this uh, EU initiative would require is it's uh, mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence law uh, with some corporate governance aspects that have largely been, been taken out through the negotiation period. Um, it would require um, uh, large companies and certain medium-sized companies, um, both EU and non-EU, um, to undertake due diligence on a range of human rights and environmental impacts. Uh, the process of due diligence outlined in the directive generally aligns with that um, in the UNGPs but of course with some modifications, because if you have uh, an instrument like the UNGPs, which is a soft law instrument, it never, was never designed to be um, a legal instrument per se, and so it requires some kind of modification uh, to kind of make it make sense in a legal context. Um, but there are some departures which um, we, could, we can talk about maybe in, in the break. Uh, but this is one part of a much uh, kind of broader European um, regulatory ecosystem. So in recent years, there have been um, a range of uh, regulatory initiatives which in different ways seek to regulate the, the impacts that businesses have on the enjoyment of human rights. Um, we have a publication here um, called How Do the Pieces Fit in the Puzzle? Uh, Making Sense of EU Regulatory Initiatives Related to Business and Human Rights, which um, we'll share a link to, um, to participants. And that kind of maps out the various EU regulatory initiatives that uh, in some way regulate uh, business impacts uh, on human rights. Um, I pulled out a couple of um, initiatives here, but the, the publication is much broader. So it also includes tech and digital ecosystem related initiatives, uh, green transition related initiatives like the Critical Raw Materials Act and the Batteries Regulation. I'll leave those aside for the moment just to focus on some of the core pieces here of the regulatory ecosystem. So we have this one bucket here, which is company focused initiatives. So we have the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, Fate Unknown but um, there's nonetheless a very important piece that is cross-referred to um, in a number of the instruments that are outlined in this, uh, in this slide. 
Um, we have associated with that the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, which uh, requires companies to, to report on, uh, among other things, their due diligence processes. We have a number of initiatives focused on sustainable finance. So we have the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, uh, which um, does, as you might expect, um, require financial institutions to disclose um, on uh, a range of matters, including um, uh, the human rights impacts of, of their investments and their activities. Uh, we have uh, the Green Taxonomy, uh, which is an initiative to create essentially a classification system for economic activities to assess whether or not they contribute to certain environmental objectives. And as a component part of that, in order for, to, for, an, uh, for an economic activity to be what we call taxonomy aligned, it also needs to, um, the entity undertaking the activity needs to um, adhere to the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines. So there's also a, a social component incorporated into the green taxonomy. And essentially the logic of that instrument is to try to direct uh, finance flows toward um, environmentally sustainable uh, economic activities through this classification system. And then we have um, another bucket here, um, a number of trade and import controls. Um, we have uh, the forced labor ban, which uh, is, was in trialogue, but an, an agreement was reached um, earlier this week on that initiative. So that looks like it will become law very soon. Um, that is essentially a prohibition on um, importing goods produced, oh, sorry, on, on goods produced using forced labor entering the EU market, whether they come from outside or inside of the EU. Then we have a number of um, more kind of uh, commodity-specific um, uh, initiatives um, or issue-specific initiatives. The deforestation regulation, which places due diligence requirements on importers of um, certain commodities um, to assess whether or not they um, uh, contribute to deforestation. That also has a kind of a, a social human rights component. Uh, we have the timber regulation, which um, some of you may be familiar with. It's the earliest of the regulations um, on this slide, which um, kind of, again requires a due diligence um, to be conducted on timber products. And the conflict minerals regulation, which is, again, structured quite similarly to the timber regulation, uh, requiring due diligence to be conducted on certain kinds of um, mineral supply chains. Um, essentially, the timber regulation, the conflicts mineral, minerals regulation, are less due diligence laws proper, but more of a kind of uh, reporting obligation, essentially. So you undertake due diligence, but then you sort of, um, you report that, um, that your, the, the goods that you're importing meet certain standards. So we have this kind of increasingly complex regulatory environment where each of these measures um, are sort of essentially directed toward the same objective, to ensuring um, business respect for human rights, but they do it through different ways, either through, um, so the CSDD introduces a due diligence obligation on real economy and financial sector entities, sort of, um, uh, which uh, requires uh, the undertaking of due diligence and real engagement with, with how um, the company impacts on people and planet. Um, the disclosure obligations um, under the CSRD and the SFDR um, address disclosures and so again are a, sort of a softer way of trying to um, drive business conduct by re requiring them to essentially kind of know and show what kind of impacts they have on, on people and planet, which um, helps accountability, helps stakeholders understand how companies are dealing with these kinds of uh, impacts um, and allows them, you know, regulators to, to also kind of oversee companies properly. Um, uh, they inter interrelate because financial actors will rely on the information from the real economy companies disclosed under the CSRD to meet their obligations under the SFDR. And then we have import controls, which in various ways try to restrict access to the EU market if certain human rights and environmental criteria are not met. So again, all of these initiatives essentially driving toward the same point, but attack the problem from different angles. Um, but nonetheless, um, there is a kind of need for regulatory alignment here because all of these various initiatives have developed at a slightly different pace. Some of them are at a, at a different stage in the, in the legislative process. Um, often these, these initiatives don't speak to each other as well as they might. And so there is, a, nonetheless, uh, even though there is, uh, I think, an appreciation on behalf of, of European legislators that there is a need for policy coherence, sometimes that isn't the case. So there is, I think, a real need to, to help business navigate this increasingly complex regulatory environment. Um, we'll speak, I'm sure, a lot more about um, these issues in the course of the day, but I'll, I'll leave it there and hand over to the next speaker. But um, thank you. Paldies mūsu Dānijas cilvētiesību institūta vadošajai padomniecēji Gabriele Folijai. Jūs Gabriele Folijai, un cēs sīnijā advaizā. 
Uh, she provided historic information on the development of this uh, concept. Uh, I would also like uh, to invite not only to look at the historic aspect, but also to look at the Latvian examples, good examples from Latvia, because we have good examples in Latvia. And now I would like to invite uh, Evita Gosha, the member of the board, and the director that deals with environmental issues. Uh, I never want to claim that I am as clever and as intelligent as Martin, uh, but I will do my best. This was a joke, of course. Uh, thank you for invitation. I'm very honored to be here. I'm happy to see uh, known faces here, someone with whom we have cooperated uh, with concerns sustainability, but I also see unknown faces uh, with whom I would like to cooperate with concerns diversity and human rights, and I hope that this will be an inspiring invitation. Though in Latvia we have various formal and informal sustainability cooperation networks, we still can do more, we can learn uh, each uh, from other, and we can grow together. But now I would like to tell about uh, the practice of my company. In April, I will celebrate the 16th anniversary uh, since I have uh, worked in our company. Not only because it's interesting, but also because the values of this company are aligned with my personal values, and I am proud and honored to contribute to the corporate culture where people can implement their potential because I truly believe that people can do that only in circumstances when they feel included, valued, and that their opinions count and that they are heard. It is very important to create proper corporate culture in a company that allows uh, to implement various procedures and policies. But first and foremost, you need a culture that really demonstrates what is corporate values. In Latvia, we have uh, our internal document, which I call our constitution, that outlines our main operational principles, including human rights, employment and diversity section, and this, ethics, this code of ethics clearly states that everyone is valuable, irrespective of gender, ethnic origin, uh, sexual orientation, and so on. All of our employees, all of our cooperation partners, uh, persons, individuals are valuable. And only professional capacity determines how we can cooperate, and then, of course, there is a range of instruments and policies that allow us to implement these values in life, in detail. Of course, I will not be able to explain everything what concerns employees, cooperation partners, suppliers and vendors, but the main things that I would like to underline is that uh, openness, uh, cooperation, culture allows us to find out about the needs of our employees and cooperation partners, and we use various formats to achieve that. For example, all managers, irrespective of whether they are board members or uh, middle-level managers, they need to visit all of our sites because we have various queries and production facilities, including far away from Riga, where people may feel quite isolated on a daily basis. Thus, it's very important for us to maintain this principle that we are one company. Uh, today I am here in, in this suit, and, but maybe tomorrow or, or, or after this uh, meeting I may go to uh, for an 
outside with it. And I have uh, had these uh, situations when I have visited the president's palace, a castle, and then immediately after that I have put on my rubber boots to go to a quarry. So we have to avoid hierarchies that prevent us from speaking, because when we speak with people, we find, unimagin find out unimaginable things about how they feel, what problems they have that we could never imagine. Mm. When we sit in our office and, and, and have uh, our cup of coffee, and coffee is, by the way, very important because in all of our sites, even the smallest sites, we have coffee machines, and this is very, very important. It seems a minor thing, but if you drink coffee and if you don't have a cup of coffee in the morning, just imagine how you'll feel. Probably not good. Yes, maybe it's uh, a minor thing, but it is still very important. We give our employees the right to make decisions. Quite often, as we are producers of specific products, that the customers are always right, but this is not the case. If the customer's uh, conduct endangers the safety of our employees, then the customer is not right. For example, when we deliver our concrete to the customer's sites, if the customer is unable to meet specific safety requirements set out in the laws and our requirements, then our customer, uh, sorry, our employees uh, have uh, a clear instruction that though there could be uh, grounds for dispute, the employee has the right uh, not to endanger him or herself and return to the production site. So we create this engagement culture where all employees uh, feel that they are also responsible, that they own this process, and then we have good ideas. We have a system where employees and suppliers are uh, invited to uh, report potential risks or improvements that concerns in the working environment or procedures or processes, and these suggestions are also linked with the bonus system. People are interested in improving the employment environment, and these improvements can generate uh, thousands and thousands uh, uh, of, uh, of recommendations. We also have very many suppliers, for example, what concerns logistics. If you see these uh, concrete trucks, for example, on the Lierbaj, uh, highway, these are our cooperation partners, and uh, these are drivers that drive these uh, trucks, uh, and, and we use subcontractors not uh, to uh, read ourselves of responsibility, but we, we still feel responsible for these people. We have uh, a special employee, a designated employee, who make sure that subcontractors uh, comply with employment law, with the rest time requirements, and we have spent years on uh, trying uh, to make sure that all taxes are paid, that the drivers have uh, good working conditions, we train them, and there is a whole range of procedures. Uh, including uh, safety requirements in trucks. For example, they need to meet uh, higher security requirements than set out in the law, for example, what concerns technical inspections. There are also other measures uh, that would make them feel safe. And I could continue for a long time, but I have to say that I'm really convicted, uh, sorry, I'm really convinced that uh, there is benefit in making sure that everyone is included. Of course, uh, uh, there could be moral issues, but there are also practical issues, because when we comply with all of that, it's just pragmatically beneficial, because we never want to end up having uh, uh, lengthy legal battles. We don't want bad reputation. We want good employees. For example, our turnover is five 
uh, percent. And some say that this is a dead organization, but this is due to the fact that our employees feel really good. They don't want to go somewhere else. And this also gives us an opportunity to invest in our development instead of uh, solving uh, problems. And there are many other benefits. But since this is an inspirational uh, speech, uh, I want to share a very personal story. And this is probably the first time I'm doing this in my life. So please be forgiving and understanding. Maybe if the story that has happened with me uh, has not happened, maybe I would not be here, maybe I would live somewhere abroad. But this is a story of how I joined uh, Schwenk Latvia, then it was a part of the other group, but uh, value-wise we have uh, kept the best. So it was 2008, I started working in this company, mostly due to the fact uh, that I have studied um, the code of ethics of this company, its various policies, including what concerns human rights. I believed uh, in, in these policies, I got the job and I started working. I was still in my young, um, I was, I, it was still maybe a month or two after I had started working uh, and uh, for many years I have been a human rights activist uh, starting from 2006, I have also organized Riga Pride and in various strategic uh, litigations what concerns uh, uh, same-sex um, couples and, and the respective uh, um, regulations and so uh, we went uh, for lunch with these two colleagues and we are just having lunch and one of the colleagues just started started speaking derogatory about homosexual men and it was very rude and I was so shocked it was not directed towards me but at that moment I felt so bad I was young and unexperienced I had never seen situations like this and I started crying and, and I just got up and, and, and said that I cannot listen to this. I, I felt that it has also somehow denigrated me and I thought that I have to go to the chairman and, 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 and I went to the office and I told about this and I said that we cannot, we cannot do like this, we cannot live like this and the situation was solved. Uh, in a way that he listened to me immediately, he invited this colleague into the office and it was, uh, it was solved just in a few minutes, even without, uh, even without using this uh, resolution mechanism. As the chairman could have said, you know, that we will do that within a month and we will use this official procedure and so on, but it was solved just in a few minutes. And I realized that what they told is a reality. And these, I have seen that these values are really alive. If there is a code of ethics, we should use it, and only then the things will happen. And when you allow the people, when you let the people to trust that it really works, believe me, you will never see this kind of loyalty somewhere else, and I wish all of you loyal employees.